Um, here we go. Uh, I'm here to give a presentation to this group about uh, the, the evolution of functional juggling which is sort of uh, inseparable from the evolution of my life. Um, so I'm going to tell a, a story about the journey of, of my life. Um, I made a, I wrote something to start off um, to help me get into it. Um, so this presentation is going to be one of the, the bravest things I've ever attempted to do with my professional career. It's been a really challenging, but also beautiful journey to get to where we are. And I hope that in sharing with you my personal process in creating and exploring these frontiers, uh, that we can all gain a deeper sense of connection with the materials themselves and with each other, of course. Um, it is really a huge honor to be here and to have such stories to share with all of you. And, and I thank everyone for being part of the journey. Um, I might start off a little bit shaky with my voice <laughs> because I'm nervous, it's not the connection. But once I get into it, I start to smooth out. So you want to find out <laughs> uh, how we got here? Here we go. So to begin with my family background, I am a first generation mixed race British immigrant family uh, who grew up poor outside New York City during the 1980s and 90s. And to give you a context of the environment that I was growing up in, it was a time during the war on drugs, um, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the rise of pop culture and uh, consumerism in the United States, um, massive deregulation of corporations, mass incarceration, and uh, the United States invasion of Iraq. This whole stuff is sort of a cultural background context of the world that I was born into. Um, ancestor wise, I actually am a mixed race person. So it's kind of interesting. We live in this globalized world now. So I think this is an interesting part of my identity to share with all of you is that my mother uh, descends from Romani gypsies who settled in Wales. And my father uh, descends from nomadic tribes of southwestern China, and they had two chains of immigration. Uh, one, uh, the first generation was to Madagascar, the second was to South Africa. And then on my grandmother's side, they immigrated down through the construction of the railroads. And that's where our surname was changed from Wong to Quat. There was some mix up with the paperwork, but my real surname is actually Wong. It's not Quat, but it got changed and we liked it. So we kept it and now I'm Quat. Um, in 1959, my father immigrated to the UK where he met my mother. And then in 1983, they immigrated to the United States and had a family of four. Um, <laughs> there's a baby picture of me. And in uh, 2019, I arrived in Latin America where I really have a sense of being home for the first time in my life. So I think it's really interesting to just see this multi-generational migration. It's kind of a joke now that every generation has changed a continent and the only one left I think is Australia and Antarctica. But this is the, this is the modern world that we live in. Uh, my home state, New Jersey, the Garden State, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, <laughs> I was born in Plainfield, New Jersey, which is uh, just about 40 kilometers outside New York City. And it's home to some uh, national treasures such as John Bon Jovi, uh, Frank Sinatra, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Lauren Hill, and Whitney Houston. So maybe some of you are familiar with those artists. They come from my state. Um, we're probably most famous for the Sopranos and the Jersey Shore. Those are the most common references I get when I travel. But just to let other people know, it was also the home for Albert Einstein and Thomas Edison. So it was like a weird cultural mix of, we got high culture and low culture going on all in the same place. Um, is a pretty centralized place to grow up as well because I, I'm 40 kilometers outside New York City. Um, I'm 120 kilometers away from Philadelphia, 170 from Baltimore and 200 kilometers from Washington DC and not so far away from Boston as well. So it's pretty centralized to a lot of cities. Other parts of the United States are not like that. Other parts are more spread out. Um, so having access to multiple cities was, you know, beneficial to me. 
um, some of my early obstacles in life. This is going to be a tough slide, um, <laughs> but it's uh, these are these are the conditions that I was born into. Um, so they thereby set the context of my entire story and something that's going to be important for us to review in order to understand the journey. Um, so I come from a family uh, with parental alcoholism, family separation. I grew up in extreme poverty and social isolation. We were a first generation family, so I didn't have uncles, aunts, grandparents. I didn't have that type of community structure around me, which makes the experience of poverty a little bit more challenging. Um, I'm also a non-neurotypical person, and I was been diagnosed from a young age with various learning impairments. You can call them what you want. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel the need to put terminology on it, but if you ask me, I identify as being an individual who's on the spectrum. Um, I also grew up in an extremely unsupervised uh, and neglected development environment. So I was pretty much self-raised uh, from a young age. Me and my siblings had to learn to survive on our own. Um, I was surrounded by domestic violence and abuse. And I have had, I'm a person who's experienced self-harm and suicidal depression from the age of nine. So from nine years old, I've dealt with those types of existential crisis. And also growing up in the United States, this played a big part in my understanding of the world is that I was a mixed race immigrant identity. I think it's harder for people outside the United States to understand the importance of race <laughs> in terms of how you fit into society. But it's uh, in the United States in particular, it gave me a lot of challenges, but also shaped a lot of my insights about um, who I wanted to be. So I believe it was this extreme combination of functional diversity in the face of great adversary that has given me the ability to overcome many challenges and is what allows me to create and share things in the way that I do. Um, one of the ways that I learned to cope with these conditions as a child uh, was to identify and escape into a world of characters who were similarly disadvantaged and in search of new homes or communities to escape their surroundings. The thematic impacts of these fairy tales would go on to influence and explain a lot about the alternative paths that I continue to choose in life. So if you're someone who grew up in a, a traditional family household, you know, you're given indications and pathways in life to follow. And if you're someone who doesn't grow up in that, you don't have it. Um, so I was, I identified with these characters and I used them. Uh, as my role models <laughs> and it's a pretty classical way for children to to deal with crisis situations um, but I think if you if you're aware of that fact and then you see how I go on to live my life you'll see how I never really gave up on these stories I just continue to live them um, so during my first year of education I was removed from a mainstream classroom and placed into an isolated special needs program the diagnosis I was given at the time was reverse processing disorder. And I actually think this is pretty accurate, even though it's not really a thing anymore. Um, as I struggled greatly to grasp ideas of social context and behavioral expectations, like I really did not know what I was supposed to be doing or why anyone did anything. Um, and I struggled to be in a classroom. Um, I remember how painful and confusing it was to feel the rejection of being labeled as someone with special needs but not being able to understand or have it explained to me what I, that it was that I was doing wrong. So I spent only one year in that classroom and I was able to figure out pretty quickly what I needed to do to avoid being in that context. And from that point in my life, though, it set a precedent for me where I was always trying to escape that label. I knew that I had to perform certain things and I was always in search of trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing so I didn't get punished and placed in, a, in an environment that wasn't nurturing for me. Um, from a very young age, I became interested in the learning process because of this awareness um, and forced to develop my own alternative learning strategies for the purpose of survival. There was an extreme absence of parental supervision, so I believe most of my early verbal communication skills came from the unsupervised watching of thousands of hours of 1980s and 90s sitcom shows and just trying to learn to imitate the behavior through trial and error um, because art imitates life and life imitates art. So uh, that was uh, one of my learning tools that I relied on. Um, 
Luckily for me, during this time period in the United States, that it was still being well funded, PBS, the public broadcast series. And I was uh, being exposed to some pretty enriching material as well, like Reading Rainbow, Fraggle Rock, Sesame Street, Schoolhouse Rocks, and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, so the television wasn't quite what it is today, you know, and there was content there. And then this is sort of a weird thing, but I also had some crazy obsession with the Planet of the Apes. I don't know. Uh, I've watched each of these movies at least a hundred times. <laughs> Um, so following these early diagnoses in life, I maintained a negative impression of my learning abilities and per in particularly, I avoided the challenge of learning how to properly read up until around the age of 12. Um, at this point, there was an educator, Amy Kenny, who intervened by discreetly giving me a non-curriculum assigned book and convincing me to keep a journal about it. And the book that she gave me, which was not authorized by the school system, uh, it's called A Child Called It, and it was, an, it was an autobiography about a man who had experienced some pretty severe child abuse. And um, obviously I made some connections with this book, and I read the book, and I kept a journal. And it was hard for me to read the book, both from the things I was listening to and even to get through the words, but I pushed through. And from this seed, this teacher was then able throughout the rest of the year get me to go on to exceed the reading level of my age. So I started off below my, my average reading level at this age, and by the end of it, I was reading things like Catcher in the Rye, Anne Frank's Diary, Animal Farm, Allegory of the Cave, Fahrenheit 451, and The Giver. Um, and she uh, transformed that perception I had about myself that I wasn't able to read. And this uh, really changed the direction of my life a lot. Um, because from that point on, I went from being a child who avoided academic success to pursuing academic success. Um, this development in academic performance, so this transformation with my relationship with reading, it actually it took place three years after my initial introduction to chess and juggling, which happened at age nine. And that was part of an after-school enrichment program called Juggling Life, Inc. Um, I had excelled naturally at the chess, and fell in love with that game, but traditional toss juggling activities would remain inaccessible to me for about another two years. So I struggled um, to learn how to toss juggle at the beginning, but I was constantly being exposed to the juggling material because it was part of this program that included chess. Um, so being an anxiously hyperactive child, I was more drawn towards the auxiliary props like poise, spinning plates, diabolo, and flower sticks. Um, as I viewed them to be more instantly gratifying in comparison to the challenges of learning to throw and catch. Um, so this program that I participated in, it wasn't technically a social circus program. It was just this guy who had an idea to combine chess and juggling. Um, but it's actually quite an incredible story and it had a big influence too on the way I viewed myself within society. Because the basic model that, that he used was he took a bunch of like poor mixed race kids. He taught us how to play chess really well. And then he brought us to state tournaments where we won. And we didn't just win, we dominated, we destroyed. Um, and we were playing teams of where every person on the other team was just a white guy, a white kid um, from a privileged neighborhood. Um, so it gave the chess also gave me a vehicle to see how I could start to challenge society and play with those roles. And also, you know, it gave me uh, sort of two really big mentors, male role models in my life uh, that, I, that were absent, I didn't have otherwise. And there's Louis DeLauro who started the program himself. And then there's Joe Manuli, who is a master chess coach we brought in to train and mentor us after we started to exceed his level and ability. Um, and it was really nice to have this combina combination because on the one hand, it was sort of like an order and a chaos mentorship where Lou was really uh, in trying to encourage us, showing us how we can challenge the system, but really encouraging us more to become part of the system, you know, to use chess as a way to, for us to gain awareness of this world and become part of that world. Whereas Joe <laughs> was more interested uh, in encouraging us to use it to challenge those ways. And Joe, um, something about him as well is he doesn't have any legs. He was born with a condition. He had his legs removed when he was a child. And at this time, he, he used a skateboard to get around on his hands. Um, and he walked on his hands as well. But he happened to be a chess master as well. 
So having him as a role model, I think, was really impressionable on me because I really looked up to this person and I really identified with him. His physical disability, he showed me how he overcame that. And because I was still struggling internally with my, my invisible disabilities. And he was someone early in life who gave me a perspective of, of maybe uh, celebrating them, not always trying to hide them. Um, the program had such a strong social and emotional impact on me as a child that I decided to become a volunteer around the age of 15. Although my academic abilities would continue to improve throughout this time, I remained a person with patterns of self-destructive behavior and was still grown up around a lot of crime, danger, and risk. Um, I credit this program for helping to keep me connected to the school system as a teenager and for providing me with some of the foundational tools by which I could use to navigate and overcome the social challenges of my environment. Um, so in addition, or complementing the impacts of these interventions that I was experiencing through education, um, I was also required to act as an adult from a young age and had been working to support myself financially since 13. Um, around the same time, I also started inline skating and deeply immersed myself within its street culture. Second. I deeply immersed myself within its street culture as a way to escape the traumas of my environment and help gain better understanding of the world around me. Um, so this was an outlet for me. It was a, it was a creative vehicle. I, I enjoyed the balance of going out into the world, looking at structures that were intended for one thing and creating art out of them, using something else in this sort of destruction creation process. I really loved um, this was all occurring in the social backdrop of post 9-11 paranoia police militarization, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the cultural rise and normalization of mass shootings, racism, and radicalized Christianity across the United States. So, you know, um, <clears throat> I know I do a really good job of functioning now, but like don't underestimate the fact that I am definitely on the spectrum and learning to understand and navigate the world is a challenging thing for me. So like, I feel like this skating really provided me with the ability to see a lot of different levels of society, to experience a lot of cultures and collect a lot of data as well. Um, and because it was like these communities were based around this activity, I could sort of like hide my lack of social awareness more <laughs> in this context because I just had to be good at the thing. And then if I was a weird guy, that was OK. <laughs> Uh, but I, I credit this for giving me a lot of, uh, you know, creating community for me at a young age that I was able to, again, in a constructive way, play with the danger and the risk around me, but have a community of people and a focused goal that it wouldn't, you know, consume me. Um, but I was, I was being influenced a lot by a lot of dystopian things in this time um, and not uh, seeing the world as an equal place and this being my vehicle to challenge that idea. Um, the Northeast Corridor Line, as I mentioned before, I was pretty central. So I, I we would take the train up and down between Washington, D.C. and Boston and just play on the streets. <laughs> uh, during my high school years, I continued to excel academically, but struggled greatly to conform to the social and behavioral expectations of institutionalized learning. I was on a clear path to being expelled from the system when yet another educator, James Brown, intervened by creating a sanctuary for me within his English literature classroom and encouraging other teachers to do the same. So Mr. Brown passed away in 2020 from the COVID pandemic, um, but he was uh, another teacher who stepped out of his role, broke the rules with me and was able to capture my attention enough to give me access to knowledge. You know, this has been a pattern throughout my life. Um, and some of the knowledge that he gave me or some of the influences that he exposed me to was a lot from the civil rights movement. So if you are someone in the United States who's interested in social reform, then your heroes are gonna be the civil rights movement people. That's, those are our models. So I was really influenced a lot by Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Frederick Douglass and Langston Hughes. Um, these are some of the other books, if you're familiar with American literature that they expose us to, things like Great Gatsby, Death of a Salesman, and Civil Disobedience by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, it was something 
uh, that influenced me a lot as well. And I was in love with Shakespeare, of course, and particularly The Merchant of Venice and Othello, um, which is about um, anti-Semitism and racism. So I felt Shakespeare was way ahead of his time. University. I did drop out of high school my last year, but then I immediately enrolled into a local community college and spent two years there and then transferred out into a, a legitimate four year university. And I completed a double major in English literature and secondary education from Ryder University. Um, during this time, I deeply immersed myself into study and found that the independent learning environment of academia suited me pretty well. Um, I spent a lot of time investigating classic literature, art history, philosophy, sociology, political science, mythology, and religion. And I was particularly interested, or my, my obsession, uh, my fascination, uh, revolved around uh, this moment in human history when people were transitioning from working on farms to working on factories, and to uh, following sundials, to following clocks, and to uh, moving from their relationship from horses to steam engines. You know, so the Industrial Revolution period, when, when the world really became obsessed with capitalism, that particular period of history interests me a lot, and I've read a lot of poetry uh, from that time period to try to understand why human beings made this choice, because the, this doesn't really seem so n normal to me. <laughs> so I was really interested in that idea. Um, but, you know, as uh, <laughs> university, you know, it's nice to be educated and all, but university exposed me to a level of education and knowledge that my socioeconomic background and cognitive learning challenges should not have permitted me to have, you know. There were a lot of challenges for me to achieve this, and I don't think people in my circumstances normally have that. Um, so this m makes me reference a quote from Frederick Douglass, which is, to educate a man is to unfit him to be a slave. I think that's a quote that sometimes can be misunderstood, because so Frederick Douglass is a, is, was born a slave, and he taught himself to read. And he wrote a biography about that process, and he talks about once he learned to read and he had knowledge, then he could understand the injustices that he was experiencing. And then it become, became unbearable for him and he had no choice but to run away. Um, so to educate a man is to unfit him to be a slave is something that was resonated with me a lot through my university studies. Um, and then so much so that during my last year of study, uh, I fell into a pretty prolonged period of severe depression, which landed me in a mental hospital and required that I take a medical leave of absence from schooling. Um, it was at this time that I turned to juggling as a self-prescribed uh, therapeutic form of active relaxation and mindfulness meditation, something also known as 3MDR therapy. So I self-prescribed myself juggling to treat my own depression. Um, struggling to exist in the present moment, juggling provided me with a space to detach from the consequences of linear time, escape from uh, my mind, and feel one and present with my own body. Uh, which is something that anyone who's experiencing trauma needs to do first. And juggling allows us to do that. Um, so I hadn't yet solved the problem of how to make the experience of juggling more accessible for everyone, but I was, it was around this time that my passion for wanting, my passion and my curiosity for wanting to share it that way uh, began to open. Uh, military service. This one tends to usually be the big surprise for people. <laughs> How could someone so anti-system have served in the military? Well, <laughs> I, had, uh, I had received a medical clearance to return to university. Um, however, in 2008, there was a pretty big financial collapse, which affected my region of the world pretty hard. And at the time, I was just doing construction work, and I lost my job, and there was no work to be found. Um, so in order to finish my education, uh, I needed to join the U.S. Air Force, and they were also handing out some pretty... Uh, good sign-in bonuses, and I, I spent three years in the United States Air Force fixing airplanes, C-17 aircraft carriers. <laughs> uh, the unique training and work experience provided me with a more detailed understanding of the U U.S. military industrial complex and allowed me to explore more deeply the mindsets of conservative white Americans, which I didn't have so much access to uh, for my sort of cultural bubbles that I was interacting with in New Jersey. Um, there's a huge part of the United States that doesn't interact with the other part. And through my military experience, I really got to see that other part. 
Um, most importantly, the job provided me with three years of financial stability and a collection of industrial skill sets, which I would then use to support my early research into juggling. So thanks to the United States military, I was able to have funding to complete my education. Um, I was given uh, hands-on uh, technical skills in how to construct things. And I was also given an insight into organization, you know, because they really stress organization there. And having that understanding, I was able to apply later on in how I developed my horizontal. I took that concept and made it horizontal, sort of. Cool. <laughs> so, Band of Jugglers. In 2010, I branched out from my childhood program, Juggling Life Inc., and formed a new project called Band of Jugglers to explore the connections between juggling and various non traditional populations. Um, basically, I just started volunteering at a bunch of different places and inviting young people from local juggling clubs to come with me. And here's a video of this is the first video we ever made. Uh, these are all the original concepts in their origins. I think it's nice if you haven't seen this um, to get a concept of how we were exploring. I particularly worked a lot with the deaf community at the beginning. I thought uh, there was a connection between the way they communicated with their hands and the way juggling uses tends to use our hands as well. So it was an inspiring moment in my life where I was able to gain a lot of love and knowledge from the communities and people that I was exploring. So I was, I was playing with everyone whose society had forgotten and everyone still trying to remember them. So I, I collaborated a lot with the, directly with the participants that I was trying to create solutions for. I viewed them as collaborators, not as participants. And I also collaborated a lot with everyone that was surrounding them who was trying to help them. So that included clinicians, doctors, therapists, all those sorts of people. Um, it was in this setting of community building and collaboration that the principles of functional juggling was born. And I'd like to particularly thank Josh Williams, Sandra Leith, Tyler Katarski, uh, Danny Mulqueen and David Ramsey for being part of this moment with me. They were a really supportive group of friends. There's Larry Goldstein down there in the corner. It's a really great photo because it's the moment that everything clicked for me. For a long time, I had been trying to modify the people in different ways so they could access the juggling. And it was through a playful moment with this man here uh, that he helped me understand that I should be modifying the activity and not him. So thank you, Larry Goldstein. In just one year of research, I had created a small community and cultural movement around the idea of sharing juggling with more people. I was experiencing a lot of pressure from family and friends to find a way to turn these ideas into profit, and I was beginning to consider and receive interest from local investors. Um, personally, I didn't feel the material was ready, and I needed a laboratory environment to develop it further. Fortunately, in 2011, I was able to transform one of these investment offers into a partnership deal with a local wealthy family that allowed me to build the first tr uh, circus training center of New Jersey. Um, and I opened it on day one with one instructor and 30 students. And three years later, I had 20 plus instructors and 300 plus students. So it was kind of a roller coaster ride. <laughs> But it also gave me for the first time an environment, a workshop and an environment to apply the things that I was building. So I built the things in the back of the school and then I took them out and I had a week's worth of classes with hundreds of students that I could apply, practice, take notes and, and develop the ideas um, more. Uh, in, the same uh, in the same month that I opened my circus school, I also attended and presented at my first ICO festival in Sarasota, Florida, in Sarasota, Florida. And this is, uh, this is a funny story because it was really a chance coincidence. Like I did not identify as circus or I wasn't part of any circus community up until this point. And the only reason I found this community is because I ran into a, a young girl who was unicycling in downtown Princeton. And I had asked her how she learned to do it. And she told me she was part of this group that did circus. 
and I went and introduced myself to the, the director of that program and it happened to be the director of this organization. And they, uh, I showed her what I was working on and she immediately offered to pay me to travel to Florida and share my work at their festival, which was happening in like a month later. Um, so if that meeting didn't happen, I probably wouldn't be here or I don't know, maybe I would have found another way. But this really expedited the process for me a lot in the United States. Um, I fell right into the heart of the community and overnight became a welcome guest at circus centers from around the country. Um, so this is a little bit of video footage from my first presentation ever. Um, if you see here, I have an arrow pointing to this face, this lovely face, Amy Elise Cohen, who was another director of the organization for a while. And she is a, uh, one of the people most responsible for putting my work out into the world, because in this time, I wasn't really doing that for myself. I was just kind of sharing it locally and seeing if people wanted to take it further. And she kind of took me and started throwing my name in a lot of places and getting a lot of people to start to call me. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Amy Elise Cohen. And what else did I have at this presentation? It's so funny because it was such a community. I also showed up in this community at a time when it was sort of exploding, the, the social circus movement in the United States. And they gave me a beautiful home. They gave me a beautiful home and they, they were the first introduction that I had to circus. You know, so I didn't know circus before. My first understanding of circus culture, um, my home base is the American Youth Circus Organization. And this would go on to shape my initial understanding of circus culture. And it continues to be the values by which I would, I take around with me. You know, my interpretation of social circus comes from this community. Imposter syndrome. Bum, bum, bum. So suddenly being asked to explain how I was achieving such results, particularly uh, the non-verbally non and in the absence of any formal clinical training. So I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I didn't go to medical school, um, but this put me in a rather uncomfortable situation with myself as it drew a lot of unwanted attention to things that I was still trying to hide or avoid attention of. Um, I didn't want to be a guru or claim to know anything more than anyone else, but this is the capitalist narrative that society expects from people who pioneer or invent new things. So I was having, I was trying to share my ideas at the beginning in the way that I felt was the way I wanted to share them. And people weren't really understanding me <laughs> in the United States because uh, everything's capitalist there. Uh, so I, I felt this need to play a certain role in order to be heard. And I wasn't comfortable being that character because I'm not that person. Um, in truth, it is the combination of my non-neurotypical relationship with information and the effects of complex generational trauma mixed with socioeconomic disadvantages that allows someone like me to see, hear, touch, and connect with people in the way that I do. And that, that, that's not the story that people wanted to hear. Um, so for these reasons and more, I avoided taking responsibility for the project and searched instead for partners who could carry the message in for me and allow me to focus on the creation process without all the unwanted attention. I wasn't quite ready yet, you know, to, to have that attention, but I, I still wanted to share the ideas. I really wanted to share the ideas. Um, so, um, in 2012, I managed to enter a joint venture partnership agreement uh, with a private practice occupational therapist who was based in Brooklyn, and we began to design materials specifically for her clinical audiences. It was a two-year collaboration that was super educational and resulted in an enhancement of my understanding for clinical and therapeutic needs. So, I worked side by side for two years uh, with this occupational therapist, and we were advancing the materials. Um, or her, 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 her feedback for what she was looking for. So I was really just, I had a, the attention of an OT where I could just create for her. She could tell me if it was good or what she wanted more. And I just, you know, really uh, got more precise, more accurate with the things I was creating at this time. Um, however, in 2013, after successfully completing a shared UK tour, which I wasn't compensated for, I was given a lawsuit claiming that everything I had created up until that point now belonged to her. 
is unfortunate. Um, I lost the name of the project, access to the materials, banned from profiting in any way for two year period, and forced to sign a public statement letter claiming that I endorsed her monopoly over the ideas. Um, it was a shit lesson in capitalism for me, but my response uh, was as soon as I signed that document, I immediately went online and made all the materials free. So the lesson <laughs> of that story is when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Or I wanted to give you an understanding that initially I didn't want to represent the material for my own personal reasons. I searched, I tried to find partners to do it for me. And I found that the thing that I had was just too valuable and too tempting, you know, for other people to want to share it in the same way that I felt it should be shared. Um, and this is the lesson that I learned. Uh, family and community estrangement. So at the same time that I was learning about the wealth inequalities of the U.S. legal system, I was getting smacked in the face with it. Um, I was also in another process of losing control over my circus school and struggling to establish healthy boundaries with the toxic type of people who surrounded me. Um, so for this, I'm just going to summarize the whole thing by saying that addiction, violence and abuse are diseases which debilitate and destroy entire families. That's what it is. <laughs> Um, offers to live and work in Europe had been arriving for some time, and I desperately yearned to escape the systemically oppressive nature of United States society. Um, growing up a mixed race, non neurotypical poor person in the heart of capitalism taught me that only the greedy survive, and I wasn't equipped to be part of this system. I did, didn't have the tools. Um, I didn't know yet if there was a better world outside, but I had reached a point where I could no longer survive inside and decided to take a job offer from No Fit State Circus in Cardiff, Wales. Prior to leaving the US and for a couple years after, I was bouncing back and forth a little bit. Um, I was able to visit and share in a few places around the country. This was mostly achieved through participation in ICO slash ACE festivals and the extended networks of their organizations. Um, so, also got to work with a couple universities, visited a few different schools. While I was still developing, so during this time period of overlap in the US, I was receiving invitations to provide seminars around Europe as well. And I managed three trips to the continent prior to immigrating to the UK. Uh, and the cultural experience of collaborating with Europeans was freaking transformative for me <laughs> as someone who grew up in the United States. Um, so I was never really a person who wished to leave my hometown, but it was increasingly clear that if I wanted to make bigger change, then Europe was the place I needed to be to do that. You know, you guys are ahead of the curve <laughs> from where I was coming from. Uh, my first experience was I visited Doc University in uh, Stockholm and I gave uh, master course seminars uh, at Circus Secor as well. And this was a pretty interesting experience because I was coming, um, you know, from, from a bottom of education. You know, I, I wasn't trying to be an elite juggler. I, I just met the circus community, you know, and, and here I am presenting at one of the most prestigious universities, having discussions with human beings who've put so much thought and energy into this idea of juggling and what it means. So I was, I was a kid in the candy shop and just having a blast. And one of the blasts that I was having, oh, let me go back here. Um, so someone I met while I was in Stockholm on that first visit is a, a guy named Johan Welton, who made the show Glitch. Um, it's, uh, so just by chance, my seminar happened to overlap with the opening week of Johan Welton's show Glitch. And without knowing each other, he randomly popped into one of my classes and a beautiful friendship was born. The next 72 hours were spent in a process of nonstop creation, exploration, and conversation about art, life, and the potentials for juggling to transmit messages other than juggling. So if you ever have a chance, uh, he's not always touring this show, uh, but if you ever get a chance to see the show in your life, I highly recommend that you do. It transformed my understanding of juggling. It, it completely broke the boundaries from it being sort of a discipline to just uh, being a, a storytelling device um, and Yo Johan Welton has mastered that <laughs> with, it, with this show. 
Um, so we talked a lot about these ideas and we kind of concluded these conversations with this concept, our summary of what the juggler means was it had a lot to do with uh, the jester in the sort of classical courts and the role that the jester plays is to challenge uh, you know, the norms. He's the, on the only person in the court that can insult the king. You know, and when you say that the emperor has no clothes, the emperor has no clothes. Um, the other photo here is a, is a painting by uh, William Blake, who's a, a British romantic poet. And this is a painting by him. And it's Sir Isaac Newton trying to measure the ocean floor with a compass, which sort of captures that, that mindset of the Industrial Revolution and this chaos that we're all still in right now, which is that thinking that we as human beings can control and solve everything through our knowledge and technology. Um, so Johann Schell really captures that idea. It's literally a story about a juggler who tries to be the king of everything, fails miserably, gives up, and then learns to just accept and, and be part of something bigger than himself. Um, so again, really, really inspiring for me, my first trip to Europe. <laughs> I was also able during this time in 2013 uh, to visit No Fit State Circus Cardiff, Streetwise Community Circus in Belfast, Albert and Friends in London as part of the No Fit State, I'm not sorry, as part of my partnership with Holistic Circus Therapy, the, the therapist who, who sued me. Um, we did do a successful tour together. And I wanted to share with you, because I know it can be sort of frustrating to say, oh, this person did a bad thing, ah, so bad. But it doesn't always have to be that way. We can find per, uh, personal benefits and personal outcomes from every collaboration. And I want to highlight some of them here, which is that it was a super educational for me. And I gained so much industry insight from being able to partner with someone from this industry. Um, I was able to do a lot of public awareness with her around the United States and in Canada and even here in, in the United Kingdom. And then also something really cool that came out of this was the harmonic site swap uh, frequency theory. Uh, which was in collaborating with these neuroscientists and therapists, they were showing me, you know, what was going on in the brain and explaining it to me and letting me play with these really technical equipment. And I was able to transform that idea uh, into like a sight swap animation. And if you want to check that out, here's a link. And uh, special thanks to Greg Phillips, uh, Dean of Engineering, Royal Military College of Canada Kingston, who designed that program for me and uh, allows it to be open source. So cool guy. Another really cool slash like semi disappointing thing here is that as part of my partnership with this therapist, I was responsible for creating a, a manufacturing system for the equipment because she was interested in selling them. And the way that I did that was I found uh, an intentional living community in upstate New York, which is really unique in that it has a mixed combination of people with severe disabilities and people without and they live and work together uh, to, uh, to survive. To, they have farms, they have uh, wood shops. And I was able to do a partnership with them where they designed the equipment. And it was really beautiful experience because it wasn't just about designing the outcome of the product itself, but designing the, the, pr the process of creating it so that each of these people could be part of that process. So what an incredible uh, challenge to have and such a, a learning experience for me. Um, in 2014, uh, people seemed to like the material I shared the year before. So I went back to Circus Secours in Stockholm, visited FedEx Intense Project um, in, at the National Center for Circus Arts, where I met Tim Roberts and Donald Len for the first time, um, who would go on to be two people who have sort of mentored my career and been there for me um, with lots of networking and things. Um, I also visited the Circus Works ICO Festival in Cardiff. Um, so it, it didn't really take very long for word to spread around Europe. And by the time I was ready to leave the U.S. in 2015, there was already a community of circus people waiting to receive me. And this made the transition a lot easier. Um, also being born a dual citizen of both the U.S. and the U.K., I was able to immigrate without having to apply for any visas. So the immigration process was natural for me. Um, but I think in this moment, I want to make a point here before we go further into the, the adventures I'm about to take 
is that there's a big difference between courage and ignorance. <laughs> and I think a lot of times people give me too much credit for being courageous, when a lot of times I just really don't know that I'm not supposed to do things. Um, so to give you an example of that, I, I was getting asked a lot at the beginning this question, which is what made you think that you could let everybody juggle or what made you think you could make juggling accessible for everyone? And I was so confused by this question because I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to. And I think that kind of puts into context like where I'm coming from and just being blind to a lot of the cultural barriers that exist. So I just kind of walk into them without knowing. And then once I get there, I just keep going. Um, so this process of going from my, my roots, from the American Youth Circus Organization as viewing circus, social circus as a sharing thing, circus equals transformation, to now starting to have interactions with contemporary elitism, where circus equals money and status. Um, I didn't do it because I thought I was gonna overcome it. I did it because I didn't know it was there. Um, so in January 1st, 2015, I moved to the UK. I started a job at No Fit State Circus. Also during this time, I performed a Banraku puppetry as part of an inclusive theater company called Hijinx. And we did a sold out show at the Fringe Festival. Um, I also started some partnerships with Kubrick Universe, or with Kubrick, which is the Cardiff University Brain Research Imaging Center, is the second largest uh, neuroscience lab in the world. And I had some contacts there, so I got a lot of education and training. And there's a photo of the Queen of England having the juggle board demonstrated to her. RIP, right? <laughs> During this time, and throughout 2016, while I was living in the UK, is this is when I started to branch out. My idea was I was going to use the UK as my base, have sort of a normal life for myself. And then, you know, three or four times a year, go play with some... Europeans. Um, Italy was one of the first places that started calling me and showed interest. I worked with Outro Circle in Florence, uh, Circo Stanza from the Professionalizing European Youth Circus group, and then Big Up Scuola de Circo in Rome. And this is also the time when I met Lapo Buteri, and we can say that Quat Props Italia was born. <laughs> I attended the three, three years consecutively of the Convention de Giocoleri de Brianza, and this was mostly part of my uh, development, my relationship with Play Juggle and the commercial development of that product during this time as well. I went over to the Czech Republic. I got to hang out with some people there, met the people at Sir Juan and La Grando. And I also started to make contact in Ireland with Dublin Circus Project and Streetwise Community Circus in Belfast. During this time, this two year period while I was living in the UK, I also I traveled back and forth between London and New York nine times. Um, I attended the British Juggling Convention. I was, uh, went to El Paso, Texas to receive the award in excellence in education from the IJA. I went to Vancouver and received the award for technology from the World Autism Festival. And I was a featured exhibition during the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival, uh, their 50th anniversary. Um, throughout this period, I was, you know, I was always looking for partners. I still hadn't completely given up on this idea of letting somebody else take responsibility for it. I think I was still looking for that as well. And uh, Victor Key Foundation showed up and started making me a lot of big promises about how they could be that platform for me. And I did a few collaborations with them, which is the Blind Can Juggle Project in Atlanta. I taught a young blind autistic man to do six balls with the juggle board. Uh, I presented at Cirque du Deman in Paris in February 2015 with their organization. And I also participated as part of the ambassador project. Uh, we went to Kenya in August 2015. Um, if you can see here <laughs> in these bottom two photos, I'd never, uh, this was the most extreme poverty I'd ever ex witnessed with my own eyes. Um, so it was a pretty intense experience for me. And if you can see my face in these two photos, <laughs> I want to point out here at the bottom, is that I was just uh, really out of my element here. 
because the organization, the Victor Key Foundation, in this moment, um, you have to also understand it was like the rise of social media and all these things and the artistic world trying to get involved in the social world, I think, is was what was happening because we were sort of expertly equipped for media production, but not prepared at all for actual delivery of services to the people that we were meeting. So we had a lot of uh, preparation for media production, but no preparation for what we were doing there. And um, I actually left the project halfway through and went independent from them. But uh, this was giving me a lot of cultural experience about this, um, you know, the boundaries between the social circus community and the artistic community and what happens when s in those boundaries, what happens in those boundaries. I was getting a firsthand taste of it. And then concluded this period of development at the European Juggling Convention in 2017 in Lublin, Poland, where me and Lapo uh, presented the juggle board uh, in the rec hall all day, every day. Um, so having a range of cultural experiences to reflect upon now. I've been living in the UK for two years. I started to bounce around Europe a little bit, experience different cultures of circus. Um, I began to have doubts about the probability of success for my ideas within this antiquated patriarchal paradigms of traditional circus culture. So there were still way too many gatekeepers and too many strongman personalities, and it was an environment in which if you didn't learn to talk over people or claim to be better than them, then no one was really going to listen to what you had to say. Um, I had just self-sabotaged my partnership deal with Play Juggle and was starting to feel sick of all the unwelcome advice and attention from the professional white male juggling industry. So I've never really had a problem with any type of juggler or any type of person. But for some reason, professional white male jugglers really have a problem with me and they love to let me know it. Um, it was also around this time that I made the connection about what was actually causing juggling to become so inaccessible. And it's when I began contemplating the, the need for some more extreme measures, realizing that maybe my uh, passive way wasn't going to work as well as I had hoped. Um, so some of the explorations to summarize, I think this is sort of common knowledge or understanding for Europeans, but if you're looking in the, the UK, you get more traditional entertainment interpretations of circus, more influence from the United States. In Scandinavia, it's all about new school innovation. In the, in the East, it was all about old school classics. And I saw this as creating sort of the industrial paradigms of circus culture within Europe. And then you have the sort of elitism that's happening in France and Germany, but that's sort of like a, a consolidation of all of the movements. Um, and then what I discovered in Italy, I hadn't been to, I didn't discover Spain yet at this point, but already in Italy, I was beginning to see interpretations of circus that were more uh, socially based uh, more similar to what I see here practiced in Latin America, I began to see that in Italy first. And to sort of summarize this period where I was thrown into, you know, the heart of all these sectors of the circus industry in Europe, like overnight, you know, I'm still young to the industry. I went to my first circus convention in 2011. Here I am exploring all these cultures, trying to figure it out. Um, it felt a lot like uh, Pinocchio's trip through Pleasure Island. <laughs> You know, I was I, I ran the, the gauntlet of contemporary circus culture in Europe and I was not feeling really impressed by it. Um, I didn't really understand why such a powerful tool like circus was being used for such meaningful self-indulgent outcomes. You know, and I think this was really uh, amplified by the rise of social media during this time. I just I was trying to start conversations with people about, like, hey, let's use this to make change and I was meeting a lot of people who just wanted to get more likes and followers, and I, I, got, I, I got sick of it. <laughs> I got sick of it. So this brings about the beginning of the end for me. <laughs> with these thoughts in mind, I took a trip to Menorca and Ibiza, where I met and fell in love with the Spanish community for the first time. I enjoyed myself so much that I never managed to make it home and spent the next two months island hopping and sleeping on beaches as I contemplated my next step and how I was going to reform the hegemonic paradigms of traditional circus culture. So I was, I was in a moment where I was sort of really fed up um, and I didn't know, you know how I was going to deal with this. And the, the people that I met in Spain were sharing similar ideas with me, more similar ideas. So it was a... Uh, 
I started to find some energy that I could bounce off of. And I had a really good time sleeping on these beaches uh, and yeah, enjoying the islands. Um, however, in reality, so this is my professional career. My professional career has always gone in one direction and one direction only. But my life alongside of that career development is a roller coaster ride. So in reality, my personal life was falling apart and I had managed to cut off all of my connections to the concept of home once again. The second time in my life I did this job. Um, without anything left to lose, I organized about the first three months of a tour and began what would become a giant trust fall with my life, literally, into European circus communities and cultures. So I was penniless, homeless, estranged, and disenchanted. But the community was still calling me on, so I decided to move forward without any roots and see what the world could offer. So this is a moment in my life I sort of lost everything. I have a pattern of doing that. Um, and I had nothing left to lose. And the only thing I really had was you guys. So I said, fuck it. Um, and I also decided that if the first period of my European exploration, when I was less actively involved in choosing my path, just allowing whoever was the loudest to come play with me, um, my second attempt was going to be based or designed in the image of Don Quixote. So I was going out to fight windmills now. Um, after maxing out my time in the islands, I swung back through Cardiff for the last time and spent five days in a hostel, frantically trying to get rid of all my personal things and consolidate my life down into just two backpacks. Um, I still had time before the start of my tour in Poland. So I took the opportunity to visit an artist friend from Slo Slovenia, who I had just met in Menorca, but was studying physical theater in Paris. And for three weeks, we explored the back streets of Paris and turned everything we found into juggling. Literally. <laughs> um, just to give you the context of where my mind is at in this moment. So I'm a human being who I'm, I have no family. I have no home. I have no money. And I'm hanging out with this artist in Paris and we're just exploring the meaning of juggling together. And then I'm about to go start a tour that I don't know when it's going to end. And if it ever ends, I don't really have another place to be. That's the context of what we're about to talk about. Um, Paris was great, though. We had a lot of coffee and conversations, did a lot of improvisation, and also uh, a lot of exposure to female artists. Um, so this is another thing that I think helped me get through my challenges in Europe. Like I had the Spain and the Italian cultures that really I identified with more, but I also started to connect a lot with the feminist movement um, because they were really challenging the same ideas that I was. So the tour started off in Poland. I went to, I can't even pronounce these things that are on the screen. So let's just say I went to Lotz, Lublin and Rochlor. I say Rochlor but I know that's not how you say it. Um, and I made a lot of good friends in Poland. From there, I went to Spain and got to work with FESCA, the, the National Federation. I was really lucky in my first, I, I arrived in Spain and I presented at their national conference gathering. And then from there, I got all these contacts and got invited all over Spain. Um, Miguel Manzano is a friend who was particularly helpful in introducing me, not just to the Spanish community, but to the types of people that I was interested in working with within the Spanish community. And Ilaria Sieri is also someone at this time, and she was also helpful in introducing me um, to more feminist perspectives and more feminist movements of circus and, and, and juggling that were happening that I wasn't seeing because it's not mainstream. You know, so I needed these people to help access these cultures. And I visited Barcelona during this time as well. Uh, from there, I moved on to Belgium and hung out at Circus in Bouygen, made good friends with Stephen de Sancri and Rika Thames, and also Circus Centrum. I headed back to Spain. So because I told you I only had the first three months plan, and then I had to keep going as I was rolling. So the tour wasn't sort of, sort of so linear. There was a lot of back and forth going on where I'd go to a place, I'd develop it a little bit. And then I went, I left for six weeks while the interest grew. And then I'd go back because there'd be people like, oh, I missed your seminar, come back. Okay, in Europe, you can do this because it's such a small place. In Latin America, it doesn't work that way. But here I am bouncing back and forth between Belgium and Spain. 
Um, and this is when I got to go see Karampa and hang out with uh, Donald Glenn and get some good mentorship. Uh, from Spain, so I went, <laughs> I went Poland, Spain, Belgium, Spain, Belgium, again, uh, for the Near Pelt Juggling Convention. And I did a presentation at Ecole des Cirques in Brussels. Um, and this would be the end of the beginning. <laughs> so if Menorca was the beginning of the end, then Belgium was the end of the beginning for me. Uh, because after about seven months of nonstop traveling and presenting without any sense of direction or concept of home, I experienced a pretty big glitch in reality uh, that forced me to take an unexpected stop in the tour. Um, and this was rest and recuperation at Circus in Bouygen. Um, I spent about six weeks there recovering. Um, yeah, fortunately, I was in the company of such a supportive community and they really have to give them such a big thanks because they didn't know who I was. I'm just this weird juggling guy who has really passion about these things. And I was having a mental health crisis and they, no questions asked, just open their doors for me. So thank you, Circus and Bouygen. Um, Lapo was aware of the challenges that I was having um, and he was trying to get me to come back to Italy at that time. So he organized a little mini tour in Italy for me to go back and gave me uh, some good company. And um, it was also during this period of time when we finalized the general structure of the training seminar uh, established the core principles of what functional juggling was going to be and created the idea of the collective. So now we've reached the end of the end. <laughs> so the, the beginning of the end was in Menorca. Uh, the end of the beginning was in Belgium. And then the end of the end happened for me in Bologna. So learning to let go in Bologna, June, 2018, continuing to struggle with mental health issues and running low on options for how to survive. I used my last 40 euros to buy a train ticket from Florence to Bologna and challenged myself to either give up or move on. I slept the first few nights on the street and lost my cell phone somewhere in between. I had pretty much stopped to eat and my body was in poor condition. I don't know if my idea was to waste away or what, uh, but after a few days, I did find that I was still clinging to life and accepted that the only way out for me was going to be upwards and not down. So from this point, I managed to steal slash buy some materials from a local hardware store and build improvised juggle board that I took into the plazas and squares and I would juggle board with people and they would give me money. Um, I also, uh, Quite commonly, I find the circus people or the circus people find me and I had tents and uh, basements to sleep in. Um, yeah, so I started to make my recovery. But I still didn't have a lot of money or resources, you know, so there's a long journey ahead of me. And luckily for me in this moment, um, I received two emails. One was for a seminar in Minerse, Minerse, uh, <laughs> Mercia, Mercia, Spain. Uh, which was organized for me by Miguel Manzano. And the other one was a follow-up email from Cirque du Soleil telling me that they urgently requested my presence at their headquarters in Montreal for a, a project uh, <laughs> that only I could solve. Um, so I took both of those jobs. Um, I headed back to, to Spain. I met up with Ilaria and we gave a presentation at the Centoro Chiron Patagonica, which was actually an, uh, sort of an animal shelter or this, this, this man who was working with animals in sort of therapeutic ways. And I had the chance to juggle board with a baboon, which was really cool. Um, and then from there, Ilaria and I took a road trip up the coast from Mercia to Barcelona. I think we spent about 10 or 12 days doing that, just waking up on beaches. I was starting to get pretty wild in this moment. And at the same time, then I was in this, this culture, this world of uh, backpacking and traveling, sleeping in occupied homes and houses. And then I arrived in Montreal, Cirque du Soleil headquarters, <laughs> where I uh, collaborated with them on a project to design. Their, their goal was they needed a room, an installation where people could enter and explore juggling without any instruction. 
this is why they needed me to be there. So what I ended up, I threw a lot of designs at them, but the one that they settled on was this variation of the Newton, which is sort of a, a, a circular version of the Newton. And we could connect the, the wires in certain ways that would encourage certain patterns of play between people. And then while I was at Cirque du Soleil presenting, Tim Roberts came to visit me. Visit me. He drove from uh, Quebec all the way over to Montreal uh, just to see a one hour presentation that I made. And I also bumped into Veronica Gaius, where uh, she was able to convince me when I got back to Europe to go visit her in Budapest. And then she would help me organize another section of the European tour. So heading back to Europe, I, I had got my return flight to Italy because I didn't really know what I was going to do when I left Italy, uh, Europe and when I came back. So I met up back up with Lapo, spent a couple of weeks there, finalized his training, gave him all the tools that he needed to be independent. And then I took a short holiday in Slovenia and Croatia and made my way to Budapest and started to collaborate with Veronica Gaius, who really opened up a lot of doors for me in Eastern Europe and is responsible for the, the spread and share of that culture. I say Eastern Europe, I don't mean to offend anyone, but let's just say more East than Germany, we can agree, or Central Europe, if this makes anyone feel better. I think you know which parts I'm talking about. Uh, but I, I know for sure that people identify differently this term, so I don't mean to offend. She gave me more friends. Veronica gave me more friends. That's a better way to say it. <laughs> um, so with these more friends, we organized another tour together. I went to Circus uh, uh, Sirquan again in Prague and got to hang out with some really beautiful people. I made my way to Austria and worked with Circus Gassi in Vienna, gave a seminar there, <laughs> swung back up to Poland for the International Cultural Education Conference, where I got to hang out with some more uh, beautiful friends. And then I made my way back down to Hungary for the juggling convention in 2018 and began a partnership with Inspiral Budapest uh, between January and March of 2019. So at this point, I decided to bring the European tour to an end, or maybe it brought itself to an end, um, but it was done. And I shifted my focus to searching for a more permanent base uh, for myself somewhere in the eastern part of Europe. Again, it's my terminology. You know what I mean? Um, and Budapest was a beautiful place for that to happen for me. I really fell in love with this city. If you've ever been there, I think anyone who has knows it's a really cool city. Um, it's affordable. The transportation is nice. The crime is low. It's safe. Like a lot of nice things. Um, and they, they welcomed me to their home. Veronica introduced me to the community. I got to be part there. We gave a lot of seminars and we were actually able to partner a lot with clinical groups. In particular, I think Veronica saw that potential really big and we, we went at it. We were, we were going into clinical centers and then making partnerships with those therapists. And now she even has a team from that moment. I know now we have clinical partners who work with her still and they've really crossed over now to circus. So we get this happening. I love to see it. The circus people crossing over into clinical and the clinical people crossing over to circus. Um, me and Veronica made a lot of nice things happen in Budapest. So my temporary base was uh, officially between November 2018 through March 2017. So basically I spent a winter in Budapest, uh, made a lot of friends, had some good times got to experience not just delivering all the time, but actually receiving from other people. You know, this is important as well. Um, this is my bedroom. I lived in a closet. Um, Lapo came to visit me one time while I was there. Um, and this is the moment when I created the abacus and this presentation. So to give some, some background on that idea and what moment I was in uh, when I created it is that, um, why is it not playing? Um, so Peter Pan had always been a character that I deeply identified with and the European tour experience definitely broke the boundaries between the fantasy world of my childhood and the realities that I was living. Um, I think I created the abacus as a way to channel and express some of this energy while also serving to close, to also close out this European chapter of my life. Um, it was a really, really helpful therapeutic process for me to, to create this performance piece. And it sort of served as a boundary for me between two chapters. 
of where I had been and where I was looking to go. So to summarize some of the other things that happened in Europe, places that I was also able to go and network, but not necessarily deliver uh, formal seminars, would include Netherlands, France, Slovenia, Slovakia, Denmark, Ukraine, and Croatia. And then multiplier events, really big beneficial thing in Europe. So through my participation and focus on EU gathering events, such as conventions or other network trainings, I was able to connect with people from places that I did not visit directly and observe growth of functional practice in these regions as well, which would include Portugal, Greece, Norway, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, and Iceland. And then to summarize the tour, the, the all of my European development, I spent about 15 months prior to residing in Europe. Um, 18 months from the UK, 16 months European tour, and then six month uh, R&D and rest in Budapest. During that time, I delivered 40 plus formal seminars, trained 300 plus facilitators, visited at least 18 countries, and created a lot of new family and friends for myself along the way. So reflecting on the success of what happened organically in Europe, I devised a more intentional plan to repeat the process across South America. Um, I understood, I looked at all the cities I went to and I was like, okay, where are we seeing the most growth? Like in Spain, in Italy, and in, in Budapest now. And I, I realized that I needed to achieve four things. If I really wanted to let them become sustainable and independent, I needed to deliver training seminars to produce the initial community, the, the primary community of people doing these things. I needed to assist them in creating networking relationships with clinical groups. I needed to model for them that relationship. Um, I needed to identify a, a mentor, part mentorship or collective member, someone that would remain in contact with me, that I could continue to assist in those development processes. And then also I needed them to find a way to produce the equipment. Those were the four goals. Um, so I headed out to Latin America with a lot more of an intentional plan than I had developed Europe. Europe was, was I was figuring it out as I went, you know, or you, we were figuring it out together. Um, I had a few contexts to get started, but the continent was still mostly dark and I was going to have to figure things out as I went. I knew that from the start. So once again, without much left to lose, I took a chance and headed out into the circus world of Latin America. And in two th April of 2019, I headed to Mexico, um, Second star to the right and straight on till morning, hashtag chase and Neverland was born. <laughs> so uh, these periods of my life, I tried to use these stories because it's how I understand it as well. Uh, I had my Pinocchio phase early on. <laughs> I did my Don Quixote thing. And with Latin America, I was really looking to find my Neverland. So I arrived there through a uh, a presentation that I gave at the Autism Chalk Festival in Malibu, California. Um, when I was invited by a woman named Kelly Green, who organizes that festival, and I met her at the Autism Festival in Vancouver. And she's been, uh, she's the mother of, a, of an autistic man, and uh, she was attending that festival. She met me, and I think she realized how alone I was in the world, and she just decided to be this person for me. So we have this kind of relationship now. She's like a kind of a, a bonus mom. Um, from there, I went back to, I went to Mexico and I met back up with Miguel Manzano and we gave seminars at El Circa, Circle Dragon. I made it to Circonvention, Mexico. And from there, I traveled on to Mexico City and met up with the people from Circo Lejia in Cracovia, Trente Dos. And I also got to visit some pyramids and play with some kids in the streets uh, with Circo Pelbario. I then headed back to Guadalajara and I participated in the Peripio Cultural e Circo uh, com convention. And I got to perform the abacus uh, the second time. I performed it once in Budapest and once in, uh, in Guadalajara. Um, and it was a really cool experience, <laughs> good memories good friends, good memories. I uh, met up with Tim and Donald again. I think this is the last time I've seen them, uh, but it was a really good moment for us. Um, these guys are sort of towards the end of their careers, but they were, you know, they've lived a lifetime of, of developing uh, professional development, like pushing the frontiers of professionalization of circus. And uh, yeah, 
it's nice that me and Miguel get to have this relationship with them. I then headed to Costa Rica and I met up with Hernan Granados, who's sort of an OT uh, person. He's, he's a licensed occupational therapist, but he believes in circus. And he's really trying to pioneer that practice in, in Costa Rica as well. And when he contacted me, I knew from the start, like it wasn't going to be financially feasible like or uh, sustainable. So I was going to have to invest some of my own money for this project. Um, and I did, but it ended up being really impactful. So <laughs> he was able to organize and network me with basically the whole scene in Costa Rica. I got to visit a lot of places, develop a lot of community and culture there with these ideas. Um, and I also got, got to uh, enjoy getting lost in the jungle a little bit. <laughs> So you can see now, as I, I think this is where I start to really um, enter a new world with myself. Um, so, Pura Vida Mai y Mucho Gracias Costa Rica. Then I got to Chile. <laughs> I got hired to perform. I was a guest uh, presenter at the CIMAC Festival in Valparaiso. Is the Really awesome event. If you ever get a chance, the Congreso Internacional de Marabarismo y Artes Cirque Census. Um, so they were able to fund my travel there. Um, I arrived there and presented at that festival. This is also where I started. Uh, I met Josefa for the first time as well. And I was beginning to experience new levels of love and celebration for life that I hadn't really seen before <laughs> within circus culture. Like, uh, if you haven't experienced Latin American circus culture, I can only tell you it is a celebration and nothing else. <laughs> so I was, I was having a lot of cultural shock, but I was also like really drawn really naturally. Like it was very clear to me, I was finding my place. Um, because it was just a naturally immersive environment and culture. I made a lot of good friends and connections in, in Chile. And then I took a trip down a little bit south. Most of the stuff happening in Chile is around Santiago and Valparaiso, which is right in the middle. Um, but there's other cities as well. And one of them is this university town called Concepcion. So I went there to give a seminar. And while I was there giving a seminar, uh, the Chilean government sort of collapsed. <laughs> the society had collapsed and there was a bunch of, there was a manifestation. Um, and I participated in this manifestation. And I want to share with you sort of what that felt like a little bit. Fire. Uh, there have been some protests, protests built in this month. And a couple of things happened in the last 48 hours and it just broke out into chaos. Um, I'm in Conception, which isn't the capital. In the capital, it's like, total anarchy right now. They have state of emergency. Here is a university town, so there's a lot of youth, but all the resources are in Santiago, so the police are completely outnumbered. Like, they don't stand a chance. The only thing they can do is try to, like, um, like, concentrate the damage. That Pizza Hut is on fire. They took everything out from the Pizza Hut and they set it on fire in the streets. This entire street, you walk down it, it's just fire after fire. And they keep having conflicts with the police and uh, they're really fucking violent here. They're really aggressive. Uh, I was... <laughs> so if you get the sense, right, and fall it into this, this, this circus culture that's very uh, community-based, very socially oriented, um, I'm learning all about Latin culture and then... I have this shared experience with the circus community of Chile, where I participate with them in this resistance against their government. You know, I'm really having an intense experience. Um, I wasn't in, I mean, I was in a little bit of danger, but I was careful. So no one needed to worry about me. Um, but the, the bigger part of this story, the more impactful part of this story for me is what comes after, which is Project Evacuate Chile. And I was immediately surrounded by a, a endless uh, network of people who were ready and willing to help me get to Argentina. Like, you know, they were all dealing with their own things. And so many people, uh, six different organizations, no questions asked, all got together. I had 70 kilos of juggling boards with me. I had to get from conception to Argentina while the, the, there was these manifestations. So you, you couldn't buy tickets online there you had to go to the place you didn't know if it was operational i did not have the spanish ability to get out of that situation on my own but i had a lot of friends and that's kind of been the theme for how i survive 
Um, so it was a really touching experience for me to be um, supported so much by this community. And then I got to Argentina and I participated in CAM, which is the, um, how do you say this? Convention Argentina Marabarismo, something like this. And this is where Iskandar Chat officially joined the Quap Props team as the, the translator and my apprentice. She was going to be the Lapo of Latin America. And uh, you could say this would be the birth of Quap Props Chile. I also started to get uh, interaction here with Jael Rodriguez of Hula Hoop Integral, which is uh, another uh, developer from Latin America who is focused on inclusion in Hula Hoop. So she has this whole universe of material and, and I met her and very interested in, in that collaboration as well. We gave a pretty awesome seminar here. It was a good time. Also, uh, Gonzola Bergano um, helped us a lot in uh, just getting to know the community. Uh, we didn't give so many more seminars outside the convention, but we interacted a lot. We got to hang out at old people homes. Uh, I got, you know, <laughs> Like little old ladies drinking mate and, and doing functional juggling. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, from there, we, we headed over to Buenos Aires and did a seminar at Ruta Cruda and uh, developed some juggle boards with Keocho. And then also now I'm, spend, I'm starting to spend a lot more time with Escandra Chat and Jael Rodriguez. And I don't know if you know anything about the feminist movement of Latin America, but it's, it's a, a force. You know, it's a really strong force and it's a big part of the circus community and culture. They're sort of integrated. Um, so it's easy for me to access that. I'm, I'm witnessing it everywhere I go. But now through, you know, my collaborations with Iskandra and Jael, I'm really getting to interact with all of these women. And I'm hearing all of these ideas about revolution. Uh, from there, we went to uh, Uruguay and presented at the first Encuentro de Circo Social Inclusivo. Gave some seminars, and this is where I think uh, things are really starting to peak for me <laughs> in terms of enjoyment in life. Because uh, having Iskandra be someone who's traveling with me, you know, the hardest part about traveling is being alone and not having, like, you know, someone to share those memories with. So it took me a while to be ready to share that experience with someone else as well. But Iskandra showed up in this moment and our friendship exploded. And it really felt like all my fairy tales were coming true. We were just, uh, I think, both feeling very free and excited about the future and what we were doing in those moments as well. From there, we headed back to Chile. So I had a plan before I, I partnered with Josefa, with Iskandra. And then when we partnered, we had to sort of reevaluate it a little bit. And also she was really connected in Chile. So she wanted us to go back to Chile and keep developing there. So this happens uh, similar to like what I did in Europe, but it's a bit more challenging because I don't, I don't think this map does it justice how far away those locations are. They're, they're far. Um, but we went back to Cabeza de Martillo and we finalized the designs uh, for the, their version of the, the modular juggle board, I call it. And we gave some pretty cool seminars at Casa Payaso. Headed back to Buenos Aires. So now we're ping-ponging. We're ping-ponging again, uh, getting into this game. I think our idea was after Argentina to go to Brazil. Um, I can't really remember because uh, Escandra speaks Portuguese as well. So she's able to give us access to that culture. Um, but we were in Buenos Aires. We did a seminar at Pies de Cabeza. We... Uh, hung out in the parks. Iskandra and I would just go to the parks at night, set up juggle boards and wait for people to play with us. And uh, it was part of her training process. I really encourage, you know, I see it in the, in the social media, a lot of people are starting to do that in Europe as well. But it's a great way, you know, to, to meet people, to get them interested, to, to practice and train yourself. Um, and this is also the time when uh, Jael Rodriguez and I started our personal relationship as well as our collaboration. Um, she's sort of her own universe of material here. And our personal relationship sort of mirrors now our project relationship as well. And I like to play those games. Bum, 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 pandemic. <laughs> Everything was going great, you know? 
I felt I was on top of the world. I had a new best friend. I, I had a romantic interest. I was endless invitations to go everywhere in Latin America. This community has really just embraced me. And then the pandemic happened. So after only 12, 12 months of traveling Latin America, COVID hit hard and the tour came to an abrupt stop in Buenos Aires. Uh, obviously, it was a time of great crisis and uncertainty for everyone. Uh, but luckily, at least for me, I wasn't alone and found myself in good company of many friends. So even though like it was a hard thing to accept, I was just feeling really grateful that I wasn't by myself. Um, although stopping the tour wasn't part of the plan, it did provide a much needed space for me to catch up on a lot of unprocessed experiences and emotions. And I am grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, I really put this pause in life to use. Um, so it's part of the reason I'm able to present and share all of this truth and honesty with you today because of this time that I had to process it. Um, to do a summary of the achievements in Latin America, there was also multiplier events as well. And if you're ever someone that has something to share here, I would suggest the two events in particular would be CMAC in Chile and CAM in Argentina. And you have the Andes Mountains in Latin America, so that kind of separates a lot of the culture uh, between places. So in CMAC, we found a lot of people who were traveling from Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia to be there. And at CAM, we found a lot of people who were traveling from Venezuela, Bolivia, Brazil, and Paraguay more. Altogether, 20 formal seminars delivered in 12 months, visited five countries, 400 plus certifications, y mucho más amigues, y muchas más familias. Um, yeah, as, I can't imagine if we didn't stop during the pandemic, what would have happened? <laughs> we were on quite a roll. We were moving. And during the pandemic, the first year, uh, I wrote the, the book, Functional Juggling. I spent six months in La Plata with Iskandera and just focused it all. It was a big process for me. It was a really challenging process. And um, I'm glad it's over. I'm glad I did it. But uh, it was a challenge. I had to take all this information, all these different conversations I was having with different cultures and different places and try to put it into one conversation. And for my type of mind, that's particularly difficult, uh, but I did it. And now we have the book in Spanish and German. Oh, no, sorry, Spanish and Italian. English, Spanish, and Italian. To give you uh, an overview of some of the, the accomplishments of the book. So these numbers are as of August, uh, I'm sorry, September 8th, 2022. So they're about two months old, these numbers. But uh, last time I checked, we had oh, about 4,139 unique, uh, unique downloads. And some of the highlights there, if you're interested, Spain is, for Europe is number one with 412, Italy 385, Poland 313. France, Germany, and United Kingdom are among the top for interest. Belgium, Netherlands, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, the Baltics, Scandinavia, and I would like to give a notable mention to Iceland, which has 25 downloads, which turns out to be 0.007% of their entire population, which is quite an achievement. So I love you, Iceland. Um, and then for the Americas in the United States, uh, there's about 300 downloads there. Argentina, another three. Chile, the same. So United States, Argentina, and Chile seem to be experiencing similar levels of interest. Uh, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, Canada, other places where we see concentration of interest. Um, so the book has really now given me a pretty clear map of all the places I need to go. And these numbers are going to guide my decisions in the future. Uh, I think it's important to note that 42% of the downloads come uh, directly from Spanish-speaking countries, which means that uh, Spanish-speaking people are half of our community. Um, so that's something I think to be aware of as well. Qu Props University Online. So I had a business model for how to survive in life. It wasn't very financially uh, lucrative, but it was working for me. And then the pandemic forced me to have to change directions. And that's when we moved all of the resources online and developed uh, an online version of the seminar. During the pandemic, we gave 19 seminars, 12 in English, seven in Spanish and 152 students. 
Um, this is also the time that we completed the apprenticeship training with Josefa and sent her back to Chile to go develop her communities. And this is when I got more deeply involved with my collaboration uh, with Hula Hoop Integral and Jael Rodriguez. Um, she participated a lot in the creation of the online materials. Um, horizontal development during this time, something I've seen that's really uh, been enjoyable for me is watching the open source community growth that's been happening. So we've got guys like uh, Mark Bielert, who develops the CNC files and publishes them online for free. Uh, Sticklins that made the 3D uh, open source juggle board as well. Uh, people like Francesco Bani, who are just pioneering new disciplines within inside the discipline. And then uh, the people from Circa Asociación de Artistas who are doing the same thing. They're just really embracing the exploration process. Um, now it seems pretty cool. It's, it's pretty normal if you're just getting here, but I started off alone. So to see all these people taking the initiative themselves to uh, develop and explore makes me feel happy. Um, and then we've also, during this time, uh, more horizontal development. We've started the seminar, par seminar partnerships. So we, we're training local groups. We have a whole team in Italy that's uh, going to be ready to give the seminar soon. We had the first functional juggling convention in Budapest in June, where I was able to pull together a digital conference, inviting guests from around the world to speak about different topics, really trying to broaden this, this concept of functional juggling maybe encourage the, com the conversation to sort of evolve into more general context or using functional juggling as a way to consolidate other conversations that are around us just so we can have a place to develop and share more. Um, and we also uh, began our partnership relationship with Circus Talk and we have destroyed their record for views. One of the views from the Budapest or one of the posts from the Budapest conference got over 3.8 million views on their platform. Uh, which is a pretty cool accomplishment as well. It means that people are becoming more interested in these ideas, right? Um, my current developments, so with the pandemic restrictions lifting around Latin America and after three years of living in, in Argentina, the Coop Props project will return to the road and has picked up a new element and partner for community development. Esta Pasando is an added documentary aspect that hopes to capture and celebrate the diversity of social impacts happening in and around Latin American circus culture. In the process, we plan to create a network of socially based circus communities, which can be used as a base for organizing professional development tours in the future. Imagine the classic idea of traveling circus caravans and tents, but instead of performance, the main objective is to share and develop community capabilities. So we, our hope is to develop first sort of an underground network, an underground railroad of social circus communities in Latin America, and then use that in the future to create a sustainable uh, touring network, a tour of professional development. So using the classical model of circus, because in Latin America, it's so much bigger than Europe. They can't use that same model you have there where everyone goes to the same city for a week and then we go home. We have to bring these ideas to them. Um, and we have to share these ideas this way here. So that's what I'm trying to model going forward. And that's going to be in collaboration with Miguel Manzano and Iskandra Chat. Um, you can check out more about that project at Esta Pasando with a, a zero at the end, not an O. And if you're interested about when I will be returning to Europe, my plans is to travel with the Esta Pasando project to Colombia. And then from there, around September of 2023, I hope to go to Spain, Italy, United Kingdom, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Czech, Hungary, Poland, Latvia, Finland, and Iceland. I hope to visit all those places. I haven't begun planning all of it, but I know I have friends that are welcoming me, so we will make it happen. Get ready, 2023. So to summarize this journey through inclusion, um, starting off, with my, my humble origins of complex generational trauma and poverty, um, to the social interventions of some extraordinary educators, to meeting and falling in love with the circus, 
I have been given a supportive space to grow. And new family and friends to help me heal. And a dream of inclusion to share with the world. I am a circus butterfly and so can you. Thanks to everyone and see you down the road. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. This presentation is dedicated in love and memory of my high school English teacher, Mr. James Brown. Um, there should be some music here, but it's not playing. Here we go. Gracias. Mucho gracias. Mucho gracias.